Okay, so I guess we can begin. Uh, welcome all to the fifth lecture. Um, we're all getting into the thick of things. So um, actually, you know, before we begin today, um, let me just, you know, spend uh, maybe three to four minutes on just uh, telling you what our plan is. And oh yeah, um, one quick uh, comment. I'm going to be using the board from the last time scribble board for the last time to complete the proof uh, of this remaining chaining lemma that we did not see the last time. And then, you know, we'll use the new scribble link that Peter, um, uh, you know, uh, must have sent on Didero already. So, you know, I am uh, right now the screen share that you're seeing is actually, you know, um, last lectures uh, scribble. Okay, so as I said, you know, let's maybe uh, uh, you know, before uh, I go ahead, let me just, you know, uh, quickly point out what our upcoming uh, uh, plans are for this class. So uh, today, of course, you know, we will complete uh, uh, the proof of ARV. And, uh, you know, I'll finally tell you uh, stuff about the unique games conjecture. So I'll explain the unique games problem and some related stuff to you. I'll also, you know, give a rounding scheme or introduce or start a working out a rounding scheme called as a global correlation rounding, which is a way to use, you know, um, higher degree sum of squares to generate certificates of non-negativity. And also, you know, uh, as you've seen so far, also, uh, you know, do rounding. So we'll do that today. And then, you know, that will spill over a little bit if I plan correctly into the next lecture. Um, our plans for what happens next is to spend maybe a couple lectures, you know, uh, once we complete the global correlation rounding on um, uh, proving lower bounds. So, you know, so far we only saw one uh, simple lower bound, uh, which you completed in your homework. Uh, that was basically, you know, the fact that there are no degree two certificates um, uh, you know, for max cut, uh, uh, which improve on the Gomans Williamson style uh, rounding that we gave for the simple cycle graph or cycle graph. So that's what you prove in the homework. That's basically the only lower bound on this algorithm that we have studied so far. But, you know, we'll basically dive right uh, deep into uh, this topic uh, of proving lower bounds and uh, see higher degree uh, lower bounds. We'll not only, you know, prove that degree two or degree four or degree six doesn't work, we'll prove that, you know, there are problems for which even degree omega n sum of squares cannot help. Uh, and we'll see, you know, what ideas go into proving these. Um, um, and we'll basically, you know, uh, study uh, some general techniques for proving this. We, in particular, we'll study this idea called as uh, pseudo calibration, which is, uh, you know, one nice general method of, uh, you know, uh, uh, generating candidate lower bounds. Uh, for the sum of squares method. So we'll see that and we'll spend a couple lectures on, you know, approving lower bounds. And then uh, following that, uh, we have uh, about four lectures uh, coming up, uh, four to five lectures coming up on, you know, uh, designing algorithms for average case problems. So, so far, you know, uh, all that we have done relates to worst case approximation hey, algorithms. We can't see what you're writing. Um... Your screen share might be frozen or something. Um, huh. Wait, let me try. Is it visible now? Yep. How long was it? Uh, how long did it disappear for? Uh, I don't know. I think maybe the whole time it wasn't there. Um, ah, I, I okay. was, I mean, I watch on the, on the scribble link, so. I'm not really looking at what you're writing. Okay. The screen. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. I did not write any math, so uh, I don't think this uh, matters so much, but hopefully it's uh, visible right now. And yeah, let me know, Peter, if you know, there are glitches like that. I did fix the internet issue. So hopefully glitches of uh, what we saw the last time should not happen of that sort, at least, but there are always new glitches. Anyway, yeah, so we'll spend maybe four lectures on, you know, designing algorithms for average case problems. And, you know, we'll, we'll study some uh, real interesting, uh, cool results uh, from, you know, just about four last, uh, you know, three to four years. So we'll study, you know, uh, how can you do, uh, you know, uh, basic statistical tasks like estimating moments of distribution in the presence of outliers.
we'll also study you know how to solve uh, the problem of uh, uh, you know clustering mixtures of gaussians um and also we'll we'll study uh, okay, uh, algorithms wait. it's like frozen again um hmm let me see what's up I am using the cable. It's pretty annoying why it's happening. Hmm. Maybe it is because the whiteboard is uh, kind of huge. Okay, so if we have uh, too many problems, we might have to look for an alternate solution. <laughs> uh, but hopefully we won't. I mean, you could just start writing on the other board. Uh, I have to uh, uh, reuse uh, a lot of stuff from last time. So this board is important. Let's try it again. So um, yeah, and, and Peter, you know, uh, be my scout. Let me know if uh, Scribble fails on us again. Okay, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll study some average case algorithms. So, you know, we'll, we'll uh, study some basic tasks like, you know, estimating moments of distributions in the presence of outliers. Uh, you know, we'll see how to cluster mixtures of Gaussians. We'll also study, you know, algorithms for this problem of uh, tensor decomposition, which, you know, in our language will simply mean, you know, maximizing polynomials uh, uh, over the sphere. And we'll study, you know, algorithms for this, uh, 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 this sort of problems. There might be other examples that I might cover depending on how much time we have. So we might also study this problem of dictionary learning. And, uh, you know, that will bring us to maybe uh, all but uh, the last two or three lectures. And um, what we'll do is, you know, uh, at the end of uh, October, we'll basically, you know, do like a quick survey on uh, what topics from the remaining several uh, uh, stuff, several things that we could see uh, should be picked for the last uh, two or three lectures. And so, you know, that will leave somewhat open-ended for now. Good. So no more questions. All right, good. So, um, uh, so let's, you know, uh, begin this, um, this topic that I have been anticipating for a while now. Uh, so we'll, you know, um, so today, you know, I will tell you a little, little about, a little bit about, you know, unique games conjecture, the unique games problem itself. Um, and you know, tell you a little bit about you know where it fits in uh, to the into the kind of problems that we've been looking at so far, and then we'll you know um, uh, we'll start uh, this um, global correlation rounding algorithm, and uh, we'll finish uh, the you know we'll finish the proof using the global correlation rounding of an algorithm for unique games uh, only next time, uh, but you know we'll we'll do some two important and standalone uh, uh, results about it, simple results, but you know a simple uh, you know but important results about it. The reason, you know, uh, I'm doing this global correlation rounding, there are like maybe two different proofs of this algorithm for unique games itself. I'm trying to, you know, choose the one uh, using a technique which is general. So, you know, it applies to not just unique games, but to, you know, several other problems and is likely of usage for, you know, uh, new problems. So hopefully, you know, the proof we will do for this uh, uh, unique games uh, 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 problem would be, you know, relevant, you know, for other problems too. Good, but before that, you know, let's try to understand what we're talking about. Let's try to define this problem, uh, you know, uh, uh, precisely. And so, you know, unique games is a, uh, a sort of problem. Uh, uh, it's an example of what is called as a uh, two CSP. Okay, so CSP stands for constraint satisfaction problems. And here is what it means. Okay, it, 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 it's uh, something very simple. So I'm just going to like define it for you. So, you know, these are problems where you have like n variables. Okay. And each of these variables is supposed to take a value in some finite alphabet. Okay, so take values in finite alphabet. So let's just, you know, call it uh, you know, the integers one through Q. And so throughout, you know, uh, 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 throughout this section, when we keep talking about two CSPs, we'll, we're going to think of Q as a fixed constant. Like it doesn't grow with the input size. 
Okay. Of course, it's it's uh, uh, it's important and uh, to look at settings where Q does grow with input size, but that will not be our goal here. Okay, so Q will be fixed constant. So for example, you know, the kind of problems you're looking at, I'll soon show you was like, it corresponds to the case where Q is two. You know, for example, if you looked at the SAT problem, then, you know, uh, XIs are truth variables there. And you know, where uh, each XI only take two, two possible values. So in general, you know, Q would be like a larger constant, like 10 for say, okay. Good, so uh, we have N variables. And then, you know, we have constraints. So each constraint I'm going to represent as pairs C I S I. And let's say there are M total constraints. Okay. And um, each of these constraints is defined by a pair of variables. So, you know, for each, uh, for the ith constraint, I have a pair, let's say X I one X I two. Okay. And CI is satisfied. So CI is satisfied if the assignment that you chose for XI1 and XI2, this ordered pair of values, the assignment values, lives in this set SI. Okay. And SI is just going to be a subset of, you know, all possible uh, assignment pairs. So what are we saying? This is just a complicated notation. All we are saying is, you know, for every, so every constraint is basically, you know, on two of the variables. And, uh, uh, you know, each constraint simply says that, you know, out of all possible uh, Q square assignments that you can give to the pair of variables that appear in this constraint, a subset SI of them is acceptable. You know, if the assignment for the pair happens to be, you know, one from SI, then we'll call that constraint satisfied. Otherwise we'll call that constraint unsatisfied by the assignment we are looking at. Okay, good. So given, uh, you know, M constraints such as this, the algorithmic goal is simply, you know, to uh, find an assignment that satisfies, you know, uh, as many uh, constraints as possible. Okay, very good. And uh, I mean, you know, um, I just defined it formally, but uh, you've clearly seen these problems many, many times. So hopefully, you know, the notation is not scary. Um, here are examples to uh, do away uh, with any lingering fear that you might have of this notation. So here's an example, max to sat. So this is a problem if, if you know, where, you know, uh, X size are supposed to take truth values each assignment, so you know, we can think of them as just each assignment is let's say in one minus, plus one minus one or let's say zero one. Uh, each assignment uh, for XI let's say is in zero or one, right? And if you remember the SAT predicate, you know, XI or XJ is satisfied. If the pair, the ordered pair of assignments to XI and XJ take values in the following uh, uh, set. So either, you know, the values are zero, one, or they are one, zero, or they are one comma one. Okay. In other words, you know, the only assignment uh, uh, which is ruled out if you want to satisfy the constraint is zero comma zero. Okay. Uh, feel free to ask questions if I'm confusing you with the notation. Uh, I hope uh, you know this part. This part is not supposed to be unclear. There are other parts which I will you know uh, say it out loud that are supposed to be somewhat unclear. But this is this is not supposed to be that part. Good. So max two sat. You've all seen this before. Here is a different problem that we spent like hours on, literally. The max cut problem, and um, it's also a CSP, which you know we can look at it as just n variables. This is just a different way to, you know, phrase the max cut problem. Um, you know, for each edge in the graph, each edge, let's say ij in the graph, in the input graph, you define the constraint xi, xj should take values. Now, what are the allowed values? Well, you know, 
uh, you win an edge, like an edge basically counts as satisfied, it belongs to the cut, if the assignments to xi and xj are different. Right? So out of all the four possible assignments to the two variables, the accepted assignments are, you know, zero, one and one, zero. You can also just call it the not equal to predicate, if you like. Okay, so we just convince ourselves that max two sat and max cut um, are examples of two CSPs. Um, but both of these were Boolean two CSPs because the alphabet that we use to, you know, label each of the variables uh, was simply, you know, zero or one. Okay, so just to mix it up, I want to give you an example. Again, of something uh, at least related to what you've seen, of an example of a, a CSP, a two CSP, uh, which in fact you know has a larger alphabet. So here is a, a alphabet of size uh, three. In this case, again, uh, so if you remember the three coloring problem, so you know the the problem I'm trying to capture is given a graph. Find a, a coloring of vertices with let's say uh, three colors R, B, G, uh, such that um, for as many edges as possible, the endpoints get different colors. So that's the description in verbose English. <laughs> um, here is how I can write it as a simple CSP. I have n variables, okay? Each of them is supposed to take values in R, B, G, red, blue, green. And uh, I have a constraint for every edge of the graph. So if I, J is an edge, then I have the constraint that X, I, X, J must take values. So what are the allowed values? Well, you know, all pairs of colors which are different from each other are acceptable. So I can say R, B, B, R, R, G, G, R, and uh, G, B, B, G. So six out of the um, uh, nine possible uh, assignments <laughs> to the three, uh, uh, wait, did I do it correctly? Yeah, okay. Uh, six of the <laughs> nine possible assignments to the pair of variables are acceptable. Okay, so I'm doing trivial stuff and I'm assuming that either you're, uh, you know, bored or uh, uh, everything is clear, uh, uh, but like, you know, somehow everything is, uh, nothing is confusing here. Good. So, you know, that's an example of a two CSP. Now, before, uh, you know, going ahead and defining uh, more stuff, I want to define what is called as a promise problem. So, you know, there are various ways to think about these max two CSP problems. Here is a way that will be particularly useful for us. Okay. So given a CSP, so this is a, just a different, I think of it as just like, you know, some approximation version of the max CSP problem. Okay. So I'm going to say C comma S CSP is a problem where the input is, is a CSP instance. And the goal is to decide if there is an assignment that satisfies uh, at least C fraction of constraints. Or for all assignments, the fraction of constraints satisfied is at most some number S. Of course, this is meaningful when you know S is at most a C and C is at most one. So, you know, let's say zero less C uh, S less C S one. Okay, again, uh, I hope everything is clear. Uh, just to check that everything is clear, I'm going to make some trivial observations. Uh, 
um, you know, you might have studied the satisfiability problem, which is a problem of, you know, checking if there is an assignment that satisfies all the constraints. Um, I claim that one comma one minus M CSP is basically, you know, equivalent to checking satisfiability of the instance. Uh, remember the number of constraints in the instance is supposed to be M. So that's what M is. So M is always going to be the number of constraints. Um, can someone tell me why this is true? So, you know, if, if the CSP is satisfiable, then of course, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, one fraction of its constraints are satisfiable. If it's unsatisfiable, then every assignment must, you know, violate at least one of the constraints. And so, you know, um, the fraction of constraints that any assignment satisfies can never be more than one minus one over M. Okay, that's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the simple proof of uh, this uh, simple fact. Good. So, um, oh, let me make another trivial observation. Uh, for Q bigger than or equal to three, one minus one over M, one comma one minus one over N, uh, two CSP is uh, 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 NP hard. Um, can, uh, can someone tell me uh, why this is true? Again, feel free to unmute yourself. This is informal. Recoloring? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we just encoded, uh, 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 you know, C comma S three coloring as the CSP, uh, where the alphabet was supposed to be of size three. So, you know, three coloring proves that one comma one minus one over N to CSP is NP hard because, you know, three coloring is an example. Very good. Remember this observation. Um, uh, one more definition before we do more cool stuff, okay? So, but this definition is like, uh, uh, is, uh, is a good definition because we are finally defining what a unique game is. So, you know, um, I will actually not even justify why it's called a game. Okay. I'm just going to define it as a CSP problem. The reason it's called a game comes from a completely different perspective in hardness of approximation. Uh, and, you know, we can somehow take it uh, uh, at the end of the class, why it's called a game, et cetera. Right now, you know, forget about the fact that it's called a game, you know, we just call it unique to CSP, uh, you know, for our sake. So, uh, uh, Q size alphabet, two variable constraint is uh, said to be unique if, so, you know, it's a certain condition on what kind of acceptable sets of acceptable assignments are, you know, allowed. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, so let's say this, this, uh, uh, I should have, introduce a notation, let's call C comma, oh, wow, what a bad notation. Hmm. Okay, I don't know. I'll just uh, ask your forgiveness for using uh, some terrible notation choice here. We just studied a uh, small C comma small S CSP problem. Um, and I also use capital C I and capital S I for defining the constraints. Uh, let's just go with it, okay? Um, Let's just go with it. Okay, so capital C comma capital S, the constraint, a two CSP constraint where, you know, the variables are supposed to take values in the alphabet uh, one through Q is said to be unique if the set S of acceptable pairs of assignments satisfies the following. If for every possible assignment to one of the variables, any one of the variables, there is exactly one assignment to the other variable that is acceptable or satisfying. Okay. 
So what this is saying is, you know, uh, a constraint C comma S is unique. If, you know, uh, let's say that C, you know, happens to be uh, on the variables uh, X1, X2. Then, you know, if you give some value to, so all possible, you can give any value to X1. And then, you know, the way to satisfy C would be to pick there for every value, every assignment that you can give to X1, there is some precise uh, and exactly one choice that you can make for assignment to X2 that satisfies the predicate, satisfies the constraint. And similarly for X2, if you pick like any assignment for X2, then there is exactly one assignment to X1 that will end up satisfying the constraint. Okay. So in other words, you know, you can just think of the constraint as being defined by a permutation. So this is equivalent to saying that, uh, you know, every constraint is given by a permutation Q to Q. And, you know, every assignment, uh, you know, to one side, uh, if you want to satisfy the constraint, let's say, uh, if you know, uh, satisfying assignments are I pi of I uh, uh, for, uh, you know, sorry. So for, so there is some permutation pi from Q to Q such that, you know, S is simply the set of all I pi of I, I in uh, Q. Need a bigger board, but okay. Uh, hopefully that is clear. That's, 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 you know, that's what a unique constraint is. And, you know, a two CSP is said to be a unique game. If all its constraints are unique. That's it. Now you know what a unique game is. Okay, you don't look impressed, so let me give you examples. Uh, again, you know, you've seen many examples, so I'm going to repeat the same list. Uh, actually, okay, yeah, let me not bother you with questions. What about MaxCut? So I claim that MaxCut is a unique game. Why is it true? Well, look at the predicate, right? It was a not equal to predicate. If I give some value to one side, one of the vertices in the constraint, then the only way to satisfy the constraint is to basically choose the opposite value to the other side. So in particular, max cut is a Boolean unique game. Okay, hopefully you're convinced. Let me give an example of what is not a unique game. Max 2sat that we saw earlier is not a unique game. Why? Well, because, you know, if, if you give the value zero, uh, if you give the value one to the first variable, then, you know, either zero or one satisfies for the other variable, right? And so, you know, this is not a unique game. Good. Uh, let me, you know, give a, a nicer example, or at least a new example. Max two lin. I don't know if you've seen this problem before, but here is the problem. Max two lin is the problem where basically, you know, you get two variable linear equations. So the constraints look like this. Okay, so you are supposed to give values to xi and xj, let's say from zero and one. And each constraint is basically a pair of vertices ij and a right hand side bij. You satisfy the constraint if xi minus xj equals bij modulo two. Okay, so this is called tool in because you know you are you're basically each constraint corresponds to two variable linear equations. So max tool in is the problem of you know given a bunch of two variable linear equations so two sparse linear equations find an assignment that satisfies as many of them as possible. <laughs> Can someone tell me whether this is a unique game. I'm really annoying right I ask really trivial questions. But yeah, let me annoy you a little bit more. <laughs> Can someone tell me why this is a unique game? If, uh, if XI is like one and I want to get one, then XJ has to be zero. And Absolutely. All the other pieces. Yay. All right. And actually, you know, I didn't have to choose it modular two. I could have done this, you know, modular um, uh, larger prime. 
and allow the values to XI and XJ be, you know, come coming from, you know, uh, the field of, you know, let's say, um, uh, the field of size P, where P is a prime number. For any prime, uh, this is basically, you know, also a unique game. Okay. Um, uh, with a larger alphabet, instead of a Boolean alphabet, you know, it's a PRE alphabet. And actually, the field doesn't even matter here, you know. Um, I could really just, you know, uh, uh, write these equations modulo any number uh, p, and I'll get like a p, -R -E, uh, p alphabet uh, unique game. Okay. Very good. So you've seen many, many examples of unique games. Uh, you've also seen uh, maybe, a, oh, I guess I go, uh, did not discuss three coloring, but uh, three coloring is also not a unique game. I mean, it's obvious uh, because, uh, you know, for every, uh, if, if, if one of the endpoints of the edge gets a red color, then, you know, either blue or green are acceptable for the other two. So there is no unique satisfying assignment uh, for the other side, which means it's not a unique game. Great, so now you understand what unique games are. And um, in particular, you also saw that, you know, uh, I can define uh, uh, non-Boolean unique games. So, you know, I can define higher alphabet versions of unique games. We saw some Boolean unique games already without calling them Boolean unique games. Um, um, okay, very good. So here is a trivial observation. Trivial, but kind of, not, kind of important, I would say. So observation. So we already saw that one comma one minus one over M three coloring was NP hard. So in particular, one comma one minus one over M two CSP is NP hard. In light of that, the following is somewhat surprising, but eventually trivial. Isn't that true for everything? There's a polynomial time algorithm for one comma one minus one over M UG. Um, for all Q bigger than zero. Okay. This is less annoying, so I feel less bad about asking this question. Who wants to tell me why this is true? Okay, so uh, uh, let's start off, right? Like this is gonna be simple, so you're gonna help me complete this proof, but um, uh, let's, let me uh, start you out. So, you know, because, uh, uh, because, you know, we're looking at two CSPs, every two CSP can be described by a graph, right? So let's say, you know, G is the graph of pairs that appears in uh, constraints. Pairs that appear in constraints. Good. So here is what I can do. Suppose, so suppose G is uh, connected. Okay, to begin with, here's what I can do. I can like take an arbitrary vertex and give it some assignment, right? So start from an arbitrary vertex. Let's say I, or let's actually call it one, okay? And give it some value. I don't know, uh, give it, uh, you know, color one or assignment one, okay? If that is true, then, you know, look at an edge that one is connected with. And, you know, look at an edge uh, that is incident on vertex number one. There must be such an edge because the graph is connected. And because the game is unique, the other endpoint of the edge must be fixed. Right? There is exactly one value uh, that will set, like, because I've chosen the value for vertex number one already, the other endpoint has a fixed value because of the unique property of the game. And now you can see what I can do. Like, you know, I can just propagate. Now I traverse an edge and that's now chosen. I traverse that edge and uh, you know, the value for that is also chosen, go on, go on. And you know, if I just do, let's say, depth first search or breadth first search on the graph, and each time I discover a new edge, I know value for the other endpoint. I can this way, you know, generate a value for, you know, I can, I can generate a value for the whole graph, for, the, for all the vertices in the graph, right? So, um, Clearly, if I uh, do not discover a conflict in this process, then, you know, I found a satisfying assignment. Correct? Um, now, uh, someone tell me why, if, uh, if the CSP is satisfiable, if the unique game is satisfiable, then in fact, uh, I would not run into a conflict in this process.
well, I mean, you know, uh, again, this is uh, trivial because there's really no choice I have, right? Like there is some assignment to this uh, vertex number one, right? So, you know, let's first allow ourselves, you know, uh, uh, let's first allow ourselves to, you know, do this, uh, whatever DFS process, uh, Q times, give it, you know, Q possible uh, colors that actually it can take, try all of them and then do this propagation. One of them must be right, right? Because in any satisfying assignment, number one, the word is number one must get some color. And it's, it's a very simple proof. And this process that we did actually, uh, even though it's simple, um, it's important to give it a name because we will use it. Um, can you say why the graph can be assumed to be connected? Well, if it's not disconnected, just like, you know, uh, 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 apply the same algorithm separately on the connected components. That question allows me to write without loss of generality. <laughs> does that does that make sense, uh, Anish? So in that context, the following might come as somewhat of a surprise. So here's the uh, conjecture that Code made in uh, 2002, and uh, this is the unique games conjecture. Um, this conjecture says, "Oh man." What is going on with Scribble? Okay, still good? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So um, here is, you know, uh, the conjecture that Code made in 2002. Said for every epsilon bigger than zero, there is some large enough Q such that one minus epsilon, epsilon UG is NP hard. So, you know, uh, the discussion we had shows that if you make this one minus epsilon one, then in fact, this conjecture is false. Right? If, if, if this one minus epsilon is changed to one in the sense that, you know, I only want to distinguish between satisfiable instances and, you know, at most epsilon satisfiable instances, then of course there is a polynomial time algorithm for this. We just design one. Uh, nevertheless, this conjecture is saying that, you know, if your instance is, you know, not fully satisfiable, only one minus epsilon satisfiable, then, you know, distinguishing between such an instance and only an epsilon satisfiable instance is going to be NP hard. Okay. There should be some lower bound on epsilon. Like if I make epsilon exponentially small in the number of constraints. So you know, the way to think about it is that you first choose an epsilon, then you pick an alphabet size. And then, you know, this is a statement that applies for growing inputs. So epsilon and Q are not growing with inputs. Okay. So it's like, you know, for all constant epsilon, there is some large enough constant alphabet size Q such that the query unique to CSP, there is a query unique to CSP, which is, you know, NP hard. So by the way, I, I did not say this, but you know, I, I in the interest of um, well-rounded education. Do you mean, do you mean there's a family of unique? Sorry, what? Do you mean there's a family of unique? Uh... Yes, yes, that you can reduce. Yes, yes, there is, uh, yes, there's a family of, um, Qvery two variable unique CSPs, which is NP hard. Yes. So, you know, I, I defined this C comma S CSPs. Um, the C actually stands for uh, completeness. And S stands for soundness. Again, this terminology, just like the unique game part of the terminology comes from PCP theory, which we are not going to do here. So I will not explain to you why these are complete, called completeness and soundness, but they come from, you know, uh, uh, connections to PCPs, probabilistically check checkable proofs. And, you know, this corresponds to completeness of a certain proof. And the second number corresponds to soundness of a certain proof. Um, but, you know, you might see these words thrown around in papers, even though they are doing nothing about PCPs, because that's just, you know, stuck, uh, 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 that notation and that uh, terminology is stuck with this uh, whole uh, area. And so I guess what we just observed was that, you know, um, if the completeness is one, then, you know, uh, uh, cannot be NP hard. 
that's i guess what i wanted to say good um very good so okay so maybe a few quick remarks first you know like when we studied max cut which is an example of a unique game as we just studied we studied this simple algorithm to begin with which simply returned a random cut right what happens if you do the analog of it uh, you know for a uh, 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 qre two variable unique csp what if what happens if you just return simply a random assignment well you know a random assignment satisfies one over q fraction of constraints okay which means the following right like if you started with a one minus epsilon satisfiable uh, instance so you know a random assignment can always satisfy one minus uh, sorry a random assignment always satisfies you know uh, a one over q fraction of the constraints which means that you know uh, it's always easy uh, 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 sorry a random assignment always satisfies one over q fraction of the constraints in any csp which means that you know epsilon has to be bigger than uh, one over q uh, or this wait uh, yeah so or uh, you know q has to be uh, bigger than one over epsilon because that's how we set it fix an epsilon then you know what this is saying is that in you know, the alphabet size has to be at least one over epsilon if you want one minus epsilon comma epsilon unique game to be np hard so you know we didn't prove any bound on uh, how large the q needs to be but you know there is some bound that comes simple simply from this observation of uh, you know what happens with a random assignment good so um, let's take a, a break for 10 minutes. We'll come back and you know, uh, see uh, some consequences of the unique games uh, and talk about algorithms for the unique games. And then when, uh, you know, we'll, we'll start uh, 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 our discussion of an algorithm for uh, you know, uh, a non-trivial algorithm for you know, solving unique games. So we will uh, reconvene at 5.50 p.m. So, um, all right, so you know, we just defined uh, you know, the unique games problem and then we stated this conjecture that uh, Coat made in 2002. So um, uh, it's actually it's natural to ask why uh, was it reasonable to make this conjecture? And then, so I want to tell you about the story a little bit and tell you what is known about this problem. Um, uh, what parameter regime is this conjecture reasonable in? Um, uh, you know, before going into uh, some math. So, the un like for fortunately or unfortunately, there's going to be half an hour of um, uh, no math coming up. So great. All right, not so bad. So um, okay. So you know, we 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 looked at you know this uh, random assignment. Uh, okay. All right. Now I am uh, screen sharing. So what, what, why, why was, uh, you know, uh, it's reasonable to define this conjecture. So, you know, like the motivation, the, the motivation with the conjecture itself came uh, entirely from, you know, making a certain machinery for proving hardness of approximation results work. Okay. There was no actual algorithmic motivation when, uh, you know, what the conjecture was defined. So let me, you know, uh, uh, um, Tell you this stuff in slightly more detail. So you know um, the way it worked historically was you know um, so hardness of approximation is this field you know we, where we want to try you know to prove NP hardness of not just like uh, you know exactly solving a certain uh, 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 input uh, uh, problem. Uh, we want to actually prove that it's hard to approximate it. So you know in particular you know we want to prove hardness of the problems that we are looking at uh, the kind of problems we are looking at. Okay. And so uh, the big boost in uh, you know having proof techniques to prove this came with this uh, so-called uh, PCP theorem um, that basically you know can be thought of as saying that uh, there exists a constant C such that one comma one minus C uh, three sat is NP hard. So, you know, we just defined this problem earlier. This means that, you know, it is NP hard to distinguish between instances of the three sat problem, uh, you know, which are completely satisfiable and those, you know, where, you know, um, uh, where you cannot satisfy, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you can only satisfy one minus C uh, fraction of the constraint for some fixed constant C, which is bounded away from zero. 
Okay, so you know, for us, you can simply take uh, PCP theorem to be equivalent to this statement. Although there is a uh, there is a reason for the name, and again, I don't want to go into that. Uh, 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 you know, for our class. So uh, this is great, but you know, one thing that is lacking from this kind of a theorem is that the C is kind of you know uh, like in actually you know the original proof of the PCP theorem it was like a two hundred page paper. And the C it got, uh, I think people never actually uh, wrote down what C they got, but I think it's supposed to be less than like uh, one in a million or something. <laughs> so it's like, you know, uh, they got some fixed constant, which is uh, definitely bounded away from one here, which was the main part of it, which was basically the key part that somehow, you know, so we already proved that one comma one minus one over M three sat is NP hard. That's just, you know, equivalent to P not equal to NP. Uh, uh, the the great thing here is that you know the one minus one over m has been boosted up to you know some fixed constant bounded away from one, uh, but the constant itself was like some arbitrarily like very tiny uh, fixed constant but very tiny constant. And when you're trying to approximate like a simple problem like three sat, you're probably not happy with that. Um, you know you 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 want you know uh, you want some in some sense to determine the best possible constant. Uh, you know that that should sit here in place of one minus c. So that itself wasn't you know settled by PCP theorem exactly, although it was like a big piece in you know uh, uh, the, uh, completing this program of getting optimal uh, you know hardness of approximation results. And so the way it worked out was you know uh, uh, there was this PCP theorem, and then I'm not going to explain to you, but there was this result uh, like a key result due to Ran Ras called as a parallel repetition theorem. Each of these uh, theorems actually could be a whole class. And actually, this is not a joke. Like, they, I think uh, about 10 years ago, Venkat Guruswamy, who's a professor here, he did really teach one whole class on PCP theorem. So I'm not kidding. You know, these theorems are actually deserving of full classes. So we will not do them here. We'll not even describe what parallel repetition theorem means. But this occurred uh, in 95. And then, you know, uh, the, the big advance here came with this uh, famous paper of Hostad from 99. Who actually managed to recover optimal hardness of approximation results? So he basically managed to use the PCP theorem, along with the so-called parallel repetition theorem, to get one minus, uh, sorry, one comma seven over eight plus epsilon three sat is NP-hard. So for all epsilon bigger than zero, one comma seven over eight plus epsilon three sat is NP-hard. That's what uh, you know is the main result of Foster 99. There are analogs of this for many other CSPs, but this is an optimal hardness of approximation result. It's optimal because a uniformly random assignment for any three sat instance satisfies a seven over eight fraction of its constraints. That's just because you know uh, seven over eight, uh, you know uh, uh, seven out of the eight uh, assignments satisfy the three sat predicate. And so this was great. So at this time, you know, uh, once uh, Hostad's paper came in, in fact, you know, these papers really developed a very general machinery. So they gave like a blueprint for proving new hardness of approximation results. And so, you know, uh, people were able to use this to prove new hardness for many, many problems, you know, um, uh, including other CSPs and, uh, you know, stuff like that. But there were like a few problems that people weren't able to show any hardness for. They were the problems that, you know, we are looking at right now in this course. So, you know, we are looking at Max Kurt, for example. And so, you know, we, uh, you know, in 1995, Gomans and Williamson had already given the result that we proved, you know, a couple of lectures ago, which, you know, if you remember, gives one minus epsilon. Uh, so it's an algorithm. It's an algorithm for one minus epsilon, uh, one minus O of square root epsilon approximating the max cut problem. This is, uh, you know, what you proved on your homework. In the class, we proved one minus rho GW alpha GW plus epsilon approximation. So, you know, that's what uh, we proved in the class. This alpha GW is this point uh, uh, eight seven eight times one minus rho GW. Again, you know, like I'm, I'm just restating the fact that we gave a point eight seventy eight factor approximation for max cut, you know, in the class. And oh, there is no plus epsilon in these results. Uh, so these these algorithmic results were known, but basically, you know, there was no matching hardness. And so, you know, uh, if you are an optimist, you looked at this, you know, one comma seven over eight hardness for three sat, and you saw it was optimal. In fact, a very simple algorithm achieved optimality. You could ask, well, can I prove a similar result for max cut? Can I somehow either improve this algorithm or prove a hardness result? How do I do that? Well, I don't know. 
But max cut wasn't the only problem that was in the situation. There were a bunch of other problems. Uh, an example of a problem was max to lin. So you didn't prove on your homework, but a similar result applies to max to lin, um, which is this two variable linear equation problem we just saw earlier. So again, you know, uh, there is an algorithm that for every epsilon, you know, can solve one minus epsilon, comma one minus O of square root epsilon max to lin. Just similar to max cut. In fact, to lin and to like max cut are really related. The only difference is that, you know, so, you know, you already saw that max cut also can be thought of as not equal to predicate. Max to lin can be thought of, you know, some constraints being not equal to and uh, some constraints being uh, equal to. And so, you know, um, if that makes sense, it's, it's fine. Also, you can ignore it. It's, it's, you know, this is a story part of things. So it's not completely important that you understand what max to lin is. This is just the two variable linear equation problem, uh, you know, that we studied before. Uh, but the point is that you know there was a similar algorithm to max cut known uh, which you know essentially uh, you can repeat the analysis you did in your homework for max cut and you get you can get this result out it's the same algorithm the gaussian rounding algorithm that gives this so this algorithm was known and again it wasn't clear can you improve this and it was especially suspicious because if you define the three variable version of this problem which is called max three lin so this is a problem where the constraints look like xi plus xj plus xk equals bijk mod 2. So everything is linear equation mod 2, except now there are three sparse equations instead of two. Well, then Hostad in his paper already proved that one comma half is np hard. And this half is actually, you know, uh, uh, what basically a random assignment gets. So, the, so somehow the mystery seemed to be that, you know, whenever your uh, CSP had three or more variables in each of its constraints, you could more or less get the right approximation factor, loosely speaking. And in fact, you know, host starts techniques already guaranteed you that. But if you went to two CSPs, the kind of stuff that we are looking at today, then, you know, uh, our uh, understanding was murky. In fact, you know, several things were uh, uh, somewhat different. For example, random assignment is usually not optimal for the kind of problems we are looking at. We already saw that you know, random assignment can be beaten for max cut, same for max two lin. Um, uh, uh, and that's not true for, you know, three lin, for example. Um, and, you know, uh, th this kind of difference between two and three uh, CSPs was visible even in the hardness results that people were able to prove. So uh, yet another example of this problem was the vertex cover problem. So I hope you know you've seen this problem in one of your uh, uh, you know uh, algorithms courses. It's a very simple problem. You know you're given a graph and you want to you know find the minimum possible uh, set of vertices such that you know every edge you know at least has one endpoint in this set. Okay, so vertex cover is basically a set of vertices that covers the edges, and you want to find a minimum vertex cover. So you know. Uh, um, if, if you've taken like an uh, like a basic algorithms class, there are like various basic algorithms, you know, for solving the vertex cover problem approximately. And there is basically a very simple two approximation algorithm for this problem. So some of you might remember uh, randomized rounding of an LP to do this. Uh, there's also a greedy algorithm, uh, a greedy-ish algorithm that can actually get you this. There are several simple algorithms that get you two approximate vertex cover. But there was no algorithm that could get anything better than two. So two minus epsilon uh, approximation for vertex cover was not known. And uh, uh, so you could ask, can I now somehow prove hardness uh, of approximation result for vertex cover? And again, we were failing for that. So there were like a list of problems. Three of them we wrote down here, max cut, max tooling, and vertex cover, uh, for which you know we were neither able to get better algorithms, uh, nor able to prove hardness. And so, you know, between 95 and like 2002, uh, the hardness people were trying to prove hardness of approximation results, which were better for these problems. And, you know, algorithms people like Gomans, Williamson and their friends were trying to design new algorithms and both were failing. Um, and so um, the way out of this impasse was found by, you know, quote in, uh, by making this conjecture, which a priori looked kind of shaky. It's like, you know, we already saw that, you know, uh, this, this, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the C in C comma S being far from one was really important because if C is one, then you no, know, there is a polynomial time algorithm for solving the unique games problem. So like somehow it appeared a shaky conjecture at first, but court showed that, you know, uh, whether or not you believe the conjecture, you have to resolve it because it implies some magnificently great results. Okay. So in his original paper, where he proposed the conjecture, 
code proof that you know uh, UGC implies for all epsilon one minus epsilon one minus epsilon to the power t to len is NP hard for all t bigger than half. So remember, we just you know uh, discussed a one minus epsilon and one one minus epsilon comma one minus o of root epsilon an algorithm for one minus epsilon uh, comma one minus o of root epsilon algorithm for max two lin. So this was like you know one minus epsilon uh, uh, and the, the second like the soundness parameter is one minus epsilon to the one half. What code is saying is that you know if you believe the UGC, then you know you cannot improve this at least asymptotically speaking for tiny enough epsilons, because you know. Um, for every t, one minus epsilon comma one minus epsilon to the t, for t bigger than half, uh, to then is NP hard. And so this he proved in his paper. Actually, there were like a couple other uh, uh, hardness of approximation results in this uh, the paper that introduced it. So in some sense, it was like, hey, you know, there are all these problems that we would like to prove uh, uh, hardness of approximation results for. If you were like a pessimist who said, well, there are no better algorithms, you might guess that you know these problems uh, are hard. Uh, and then you know uh, you could want to prove uh, results that prove this hardness, but you were not able to do that. So Code just made a conjecture, the unique gains conjecture, the one that we just saw, and he uh, used it to prove you know uh, hardness results of the form I just showed you. Okay, so so far so good. This was nice. Um, um, actually, you know I I don't know what was going on then. I mean um, uh, I I certainly wasn't doing theory uh, at that time. But I imagine that people were probably like, yeah, you know, I don't know, but I don't believe this conjecture. It's like, what's this conjecture? It was kind of important because Kurt Subhash was basically a grad student at Princeton then. Um, so it was, I think, uh, he was in his uh, third year of PhD or something, and he just said, okay, you know, there are a bunch of problems I'm gonna, I'm stuck on. Let me just make a conjecture to get out of them. I'm sure it was more serious than that, but you know, you could look at it like that. <laughs> so uh, that was great. Uh, the the real uh, or at least you know uh, the the point where people began taking it seriously uh, happened in two papers. Uh, again, this is my interpretation of history, so you know I'm allowed to have some I guess uh, relaxed version of the events. I don't know exactly if this is how it went, but I imagine that people began taking it seriously after you know the next two results. So Subhash with Oded Regev um, in 2003. He proved that you know, UGC implies two minus epsilon vertex cover is NP hard. So for all epsilon bigger than zero, um, UGC implies that there is no two minus epsilon factor approximation algorithm for the vertex cover problem. So this looked weird. It's like you know, there's this basic algorithm that you study you know in your first algorithms class, and apparently you know you can't improve it if you assume this funky new conjecture. Um, one year later, this this result is in some sense uh, uh, the, the first result that somehow um, uh, makes some really surprising connections and you know somehow uh, 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 clarifies what's going on in a certain sense, or at least begins the task of clarifying what's going on. So this occurred in two thousand and four. And this paper proved some real surprising results. In particular, it proved that UGC implies um, one minus rho GW alpha GW epsilon max cut uh, 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 problem is NP hard. So the reason I'm writing it like this is because without the epsilon, is precisely the guarantee we proved on the Gomans Williamson algorithm. This is precisely the algorithm, the guarantee that we proved in the class. But actually, you know, uh, the result is stronger than this. So this, in some sense, you know, is is proving a certain gap at certain parameter range, right? But on the homework, you proved that you know, for every epsilon, the GW rounding can basically, you know, take a one minus epsilon satisfiable instance, and find you know a cut of size one minus O of root epsilon in a normalized sense. Right, so actually, the result proved that for all epsilon bigger than zero, one minus epsilon. Um, okay, actually, let me state this result in a bit. Uh, 
let, let's just let yeah so uh, let's just maybe enjoy this result for a bit so you know uh, this 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 2004 paper proved that you know basically the algorithm that we designed with this funky irrational number uh, 0.878 blah 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 approximation factor is actually uh, you know uh, somehow uh, tight that there is no way to improve it unless p equals np um so you know in some sense uh, so if you if you look at this original result in court's paper it's only kind of qualitatively making this uh, statement because you know uh, it's only like saying that you know for tiny enough epsilon you cannot asymptotically improve this 1 minus epsilon to 1 minus square root epsilon guarantee for 2 len this result is making a really sharp constant like sharp up to constant statement saying that you know this 0.878 guarantee that you got well that cannot be improved okay and actually uh, uh, beyond the result itself this paper made several surprising connections between the very rounding this saw gaussian rounding of sdps and you know uh, 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 two csps so in a certain sense you know uh, uh, even though the result was proving this only about for max cut and like for certain uh, other uh, special case of two csps it was already apparent in this paper that there is kind of a fundamental relationship between you know what approximation guarantees you can obtain by simply like taking a gaussian uh, the kind of gaussian rounding that we did for max cut and you know what is the best possible approximation factor that can be obtained for that problem so there seem to be like some fundamental connection between the simple sdp based algorithm that we just saw like a very specific algorithm um, and you know the hardness that you can derive using the unique games conjecture so it was kind of apparent although it was proven only for max cut so okay so what happened next uh, so um I actually don't remember the year, but this might be, I don't know, somewhere between 2004 and 2008. So let's say 2006, it's my uh, guess. <laughs> so um, O'Donnell and Wu, they uh, extended the max cut in approximability result to uh, something that basically matches the bounds you proved on your homework. So basically, you know, uh, for all epsilon, they gave some, you know, Okay, let's maybe state it uh, instead of approximation factor, let's state it this way. So, um, So um, I think uh, uh, in, in, when we did the, the algorithm for max cut, all we said was that, you know, the rounding algorithm and its analysis that we did basically gives you the right, uh, 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 right approximation factor only, you know, in this regime where uh, you lose 0.878. So it's like, you know, if you were only comparing the ratio of, you know, the true value to the return, like the output value, then basically, you know, that algorithm is tight. But you know, there is a more fine grained question you can ask, which is, you know, suppose the input graph uh, has a normalized cutoff size one minus epsilon, what's the best possible, uh, what's the largest possible cut that I can find in polynomial time? In worst case, over all graphs where, you know, the true maximum is one minus epsilon. So for every epsilon, this in some sense is like a new question. And you can ask what's the right rounding to do for each of these questions. So it turns out it's not Gaussian rounding. It's this RPR square rounding that we briefly discussed in one of the lectures, like the lectures on quadratic optimization. Well, O'Donnell and Wu proved that if you want to beat whatever is the approximation ratio that comes out of that RPR square rounding, well then, you know, uh, uh, under the UGC, it's going to be NP hard. And so, you know, in some sense, it, it, the unique games conjecture, even though uh, it probably wasn't imagined by its maker uh, in 2002, was making some really sharp and precise predictions. Uh, you know, it was making predictions like this SDP rounding, this particular SDP rounding is somehow tied for max cut. Um, 
perhaps you know in some sense it was like a natural culmination of what was happening in orangal wu but you know uh, the result was, was somehow the punchline of all this line of work came in 2008 where uh, you know prasad raghavendra who is at berkeley right now he proved that basically an analog of the result of orangal and wu holds for every constraint satisfaction problem not just max cut so for every every csp there is a fixed uh, there is uh, there is a natural sdp which is basically degree 2 sum of squares plus a natural rounding which is the analog of rpr square that is optimal under ugc so you know this 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 result which obviously is like you know amazing culmination of a sequence of you know uh, more and more exciting works was basically you know clarifying what was going on you know finally was saying that basically ugc uh, in some sense is closely related to um uh, you know the optimality of this very simple algorithm that we've been discussing in this class you know you where you take degree 2 sum of squares and you know uh, do some simple rounding the analog you know some examples of which you've seen in the classes here it's like you know ugc was saying that you know there is no way uh, to beat uh, the guarantees of this algorithms in polynomial time and uh, you know these results were uh, these results uh, you know were, were so you know i uh, perhaps one of you will choose uh, uh, you know one of these results as a topic for um, you know your lecture notes that are part of this class so we'll maybe see a little bit more of this we will not um, yeah it was kind of a decision to make and i decided that we'll not cover any of this results uh, in detail uh, but they were making some really surprising connections between you know uh, uh, sdps and how you can you know use unique gains conjecture to prove new hardness of approximation results so um that was great in some sense you know what uh, 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 you know by 2008 it was clear that you know in some sense what you just say saying is that whatever we're doing so far is basically the best we can do that's awesome but now you can ask is it true <laughs> um is uh, ugc uh, true so you know maybe in 2002 this question wasn't super interesting uh, even though it was already kind of interesting then uh, by 2008 it was making such really precise predictions that the question you know is like super duper important if if a conjecture is making such precise predictions you've got to understand whether it is true so you can ask you know uh, well uh, Uh, whether uh, you know how how much do we know about the truth of the unique gains conjecture so let me tell you a little bit about this story now um one way to say it one 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 comment um, uh, again like a lot of loose comments in this part but you know i'm going to permit myself to do it so that, you know there are several conjectures in computational complexity and you know you've heard of some you for example heard of p not equal to np um many of these conjectures are in a state where we do not believe we can make progress on them you know in the next 10 years for example like p not equal to np yeah maybe there is like 1% or i don't know 0.1% chance that somebody will settle it in the next 10 years ugc seems like one of those questions which you know has profound consequences and yet could actually be settled in the next 10 years so in some sense you know it 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 uh, you know it's uh, is one of those uh, goldilock conjectures you know it's like it's powerful enough to make really precise and interesting predictions and yet it almost seems to be within our reach uh, in terms of proving it um, in the next 10 years so that's great right um, many of these results could become unconditional at least conditional only on p not equal to np uh, if that happens uh, so let me tell you you know what's known in the direction so far So I guess one thing I've been using, and you know, let's uh, make sure that uh, you agree with me. So if there's a uh, C by S approximation algorithm for C comma S CSP, um, actually, wait uh, for a CSP. then uh, c comma s csp is uh, easy i mean this is a trivial claim and i i realize that i already used it a bunch of times but i want to make sure that you're all with me 
So, you know, when I look at C comma S CSP, which is the problem of distinguishing between, you know, uh, instances of a CSP where, you know, C fraction of the constraints can be satisfied versus at most S fraction of the constraints can be satisfied. Well, you know, if I had a C comma C over S approximation algorithm, then, you know, I would be able to solve this problem. And uh, the reason simply is that, you know, I'll run this C over, C over S approximation algorithm. And then, you know, if the value, if the, if the fraction of constraints that can be satisfied by some assignment in the CSP is at least C, then I'll get a, you know, assignment that satisfies at least C over S times, uh, 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 wait, did I work correctly? Ah, S over C. S over C. S over C uh, times C, which is, you know, S. So, you know, basically the point is that if I have better than S over C approximation algorithm for the CSP, then I can certainly solve C comma S uh, 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 version of this problem. Okay, so I've been using this implicitly, but I hope, uh, you know, it wasn't too much of a bother. It's, it's a simple observation. Uh, and so I'm going to, you know, state guarantees in terms of, you know, still the C comma S CSP uh, language that we've been talking about so far. So, in his original paper, the same paper that, you know, could propose this conjecture in, he actually gave a non-trivial algorithm for CSP. So, you know, we already saw a trivial algorithm, which is, you know, a trivial algorithm gives a one over Q fraction approximation that we already saw. Uh, Kurt already improved on this. He gave a O of Q square. Q was the, remember the alphabet size. So the way to understand it is that, you know, if, so this algorithm, if you give it input, uh, you know, an instance where one minus epsilon fraction of the constraints can be satisfied, then it outputs an assignment that satisfies, you know, this fraction of the constraints. Okay. And, and the point is that, you know, in, in some regime, when epsilon is like tiny enough, then this uh, is much better than one over Q. So it beats the guarantees of this trivial algorithm. So for epsilon small enough, this is better than one over Q approximation. And so in some sense, you should think of algorithms as trying to narrow the, the parameter range, uh, you know, in which uh, uh, the unique gains conjecture could be true. And so code already, uh, you know, gave this, but this is fine because, you know, uh, the conjecture still stands because, you know, I'm just going to choose uh, uh, Q to be large enough. So remember that, you know, if this is the best, like this were the best approximation algorithm, I can choose Q to be large enough as a function of epsilon so that this second term here becomes smaller than epsilon. Right? So remember the conjecture said that for every epsilon, I can choose a Q large enough so that one minus epsilon comma epsilon UG is, you know, NP hard. So I certainly have to, you know, uh, choose a parameter regime in which this algorithm doesn't kill the conjecture, but that's fine, right? All this is saying, all this is saying is that you better choose Q larger than, what is it? Epsilon, uh, one over uh, epsilon to the five over two, roughly. You know, up to some log factors. So he's saying that, okay, you know, uh, if you choose Q large enough, it's still good. So. This is, this, is no, this is no barrier to the conjecture being true. But you know, over the years, people uh, tried very hard to build better algorithms than this, and they succeeded. So um, the record, so there's like a bunch of papers that I don't want to tell you about, but the optimal, or at least the best possible algorithm in this direction is due to, the, uh, due to Charikar, Makarichev, and Makarichev. I think this is 07. For some reason, I don't have notes, uh, no, don't have dates in my notes. Um, who basically gave an algorithm for one minus epsilon, one minus O of
So, you know, this forces you, so, so far, you know, Q were, so one way to think about this results is, you know, how large are they forcing Q as a function of epsilon, okay? And the first result only forced Q to be larger than some polynomial in one over epsilon. Well, this result is gonna force Q to be larger than some exponential in one over epsilon. But that's still fine because we were, we were allowed to use any function, okay? And so now you could ask, can I, uh, can I better this algorithm? Okay, where does this arms race lead to? Like, can I, can I improve this algorithm? Can I give even better bounds? So it turns out that if the Unigian's conjecture is true, then in fact, it has to be true with these parameters. In a certain sense, UGC implies that these are, this is the best you can do algorithmically. So here is the theorem. So it's the same KKMO paper I, uh, I told you before. Huh, that's a bit confusing. So this must be the 04 then. Otherwise some time travel is going on over here. So um, what they proved is that UGC implies for all epsilon bigger than zero, one minus epsilon root two over pi, the precise constant So um, the thing to notice here is, you know, the second term. Uh, yeah, the thing to notice here is uh, this, uh, wait, uh, one minus, okay. The thing to notice here is the corrected second term. <laughs> and the point is that, you know, it's basically up to fixed constants, the same term that appears in this algorithm. And so what this, what, what KKM approved is that if UGC is true at all, then in fact, it must be true with basically, you know, some, some dependence, which looks like O of root epsilon log Q in the second term over here. So in that precise sense, this is the best algorithm um, that can exist if UGC is true. In particular, if you wanted to disprove the Unigames conjecture, all you have to do is like improve the CMM algorithm a little bit. So enough to improve CMM algo to beat UGC. Good. Uh, wait, where are my next notes? Oh, there we are. So that's good. And so, you know, that was about 2004. That's about 15 years ago. And you can ask, has it happened yet? Well, it hasn't happened yet. And that's um, claiming that time travel is real. That time travel is real? Yeah, CMM is apparently from 06. Ah, okay. So I think, I think what must have happened, I'm guessing here, uh, or 06, what must have happened is that, you know, there's a journal version and a conference version of KKMO. And I think maybe they discovered uh, one, you know, before the journal version came out, maybe, you know, KKMO figured out this extension. So I don't know what year to cite here. Let me just say KKMO. I'm not a good historian. Um, very good, right? So, oh no. Okay, so, you know, so far, basically the, the model of the story is, you know, that people uh, tried quite hard to understand, you know, what's this dependence on Q and whether you can like beat it with algorithms. Um, and, you know, they arrived at this uh, two results which kind of nailed down the dependence on Q. Basically said that Q being a single exponential in one over epsilon has to be enough. If anything works, then a singly exponentially large Q works. That's what is the message of these two works. Um, and so far, we don't know a better algorithm. So the UC could uh, still be true. Uh, that's good. <laughs> um, uh, but these were all about, you know, these were results about, uh, uh, these were results about polynomial time algorithms. In fact, you know, all of these algorithms were using degree two sum of squares. So I, I haven't quite defined for you what does it mean to apply, uh, you know, uh, uh, sum of squares to non-Boolean problems so far. But you know, uh, we'll see that very soon. Let's just call it degree two SOS as for some uh, for, for something that you can imagine as the analog of what we are doing for Boolean problems so far. 
And you can ask, okay, can I somehow win by going to higher rounds? Of course, you know, uh, if you go to only constantly high rounds, like if you go for degree four, degree six, degree 10, whatever, it will obviously, you know, if you improve the CMM algorithm, you will beat the unique games, you will disprove it. We didn't, uh, we don't quite know how to do that. But um, uh, kind of a big step in uh, this direction came in uh, 2010 in this paper of uh, Aurora, uh, Barak, and uh, Stroyer. And they proved uh, that actually something non-trivial happens if you go to super constant rounds of, uh, you know, super constant degree SOS. So they proved what, you know, can be thought of in some ways as a sub exponential algorithm. They proved that, you know, uh, for all Q uh, epsilon, there exists a two to the Q square n to the O of epsilon to the one third time algorithm to find a half satisfiable assignment for any one minus epsilon satisfiable instance of UG. So, you know, in our, in, in the language we've been using so far, this is same as saying that, you know, one minus epsilon comma half UG has a two to the Q square N to the O of epsilon to the one third time algorithm. So, okay, what is this good for? <laughs> um, so, so let's, let's maybe try to understand what's happening, right? Like if epsilon, uh, so what, what this is saying, so this is, I guess the, the thing to observe is that this is much, much smaller than two to the N. So this is not doing, you know, or, um, so, you know, if you were to do brute force search, then, you know, it would be Q to the N which would be two to the n log q, whatever, right? So q is a fixed constant, so ignore the dependence on q. So a brute force algorithm for this problem would have run in two to the O of n time. What this is saying is that, you know, you can actually solve the problem or, you know, at least in this sense, in a truly sub-exponential time, a time that is two to the little O of n. So I guess the thing to observe is that this function is two to the little O of n. And okay, so you could ask, why is that surprising? I mean, aren't we interested in polynomial time algorithms? So for that, I need to tell you a, 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 a stronger version of P not equal to NP. So here is basically, uh, here's the statement. Uh, so this, this is called the exponential time hypothesis. You can think of it as like a strengthening of uh, uh, the statement that P is not equal to NP. It was made uh, by uh, Impagliazzo, Cabinets, and Vigderson in 2001. And basically what they said is, you know, what, what you would imagine, like, you know, there is uh, the three sat does not have a two to the little o of n algorithm. And this is consistent with all that we know about three sat and algorithms for it. There are two to the n algorithms. There are two, there's clearly a two to the n time algorithm for solving the three sat problem. There's in fact, if I remember correctly, there's a two to the point 63 n algorithm also for solving the three sat. So you can beat brute force by a little bit. Uh, but what this conjecture says is that, you know, there is no way to beat it, uh, uh, beat this, uh, you know, brute forces algorithms uh, and get like a two to the little of n algorithm, like two to the n over log n algorithm for, for you know, if, if, if you want, okay? In particular, you know, uh, you can just do the uh, reduction that you learn in school. Sorry, I mean, uh, you know, first class on algorithms uh, from three sat into uh, three coloring. And that reduction implies that three coloring doesn't have a two to the little o of n algorithm. Okay, so why am I stating it this way? I'm saying that, you know, if you look at two CSPs, the kind of problems that unique games is the Unigames kind of sits inside this class of problems that Unigames sits inside, then two CSPs in fact are not expected to have two to the little of n time algorithms. At least, you know, uh, uh, if you believe this stronger variant of P not equal to NP, which is consistent with our knowledge. 
what this result was saying was that, well, you know, if by chance you were thinking that the unique games problem would be as hard as let's say three sat or three coloring, well, not quite. There's in fact a two to the little of an, uh, there's, there's in fact a two to the, you know, uh, little of an algorithm for this problem. And, you know, if in fact, if you could make this n to the O of epsilon to the one third function setting here, if you could make it n to the little O of one, then it will refute uh, 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 unique games conjecture. So uh, given that there's a lot of story going on and I haven't had much uh, interactivity, I would like someone to tell me why that is true. <laughs> so uh, I claim that if there was a two to the n to the little of one algorithm, so let me maybe uh, write it down here. If UG has a two to the n to the little of one algorithm, then ETH implies that UGC is false. Feel free to unmute yourself and give this a go. It's probably because we can get an approximation algorithm for one of the CSPs we discussed. Uh, art on the ETH. Uh, I mean, the algorithm is uh, here, right? Like UG is a CSP that actually is promised to have this algorithm here. I'm just saying that, you know, if you make this stronger assumption that exponential time hypothesis holds and you find me like a better than, you know, two to the end to the little of one algorithm, then in fact, you know, UGC must be false. Okay, so this is, this is just an exercise in unpacking definition. So let me do it for you. Um, if UG, so, so let's, let's, you know, prove it uh, by, uh, uh, you know, generating a contradiction. So if UGC is true, then there is a polynomial time reduction that takes a three sat instance and produces a UG instance. Agree? Okay, if you don't agree, then interject. Otherwise, I'm, I'm assuming that this, you agree. You know, that's, that's literally what, you know, what, uh, you know, NP hardness means, that there is a polynomial time reduction algorithm that takes a three sat instance and produces a unique games instance. So now, you know, um, you apply the two to the n to the little of one algorithm that was promised to you. And the point is this, what is the running time of this algorithm in the size of the original instance? So if you started with, let's say, n size instance, let's say you produce an n to the 10 size UG instance. Well, two to the n to the 10 to the little of one is also two to the n to the little of one which means that you found a two to the end to the little of one algorithms for three sat. Uh, you know, which uh, contradicts uh, ETH. So um, I hope that was clear. I mean, this is, this is all supposed to be simple stuff, but you know, I'm, I'm telling you so many stories that things can get confusing. History is hard. Um, I guess the point of this discussion was that, you know, there are two ways to disprove the unique games conjecture. One is to, you know, design a very, very good uh, polynomial time algorithm, that one that beats the Charikar, Makarichev, Makarichev result. The other is to, you know, make this stronger conjecture than P, P not equal to NP, the exponential time hypothesis, and just find a two to the end of the little of one time algorithm. It won't in some sense settle uh, uh, the unique games conjecture, but it will give a very strong evidence that it's likely false, right? At least, uh, you know, uh, one of the one of two great conjectures has to be false. If, if you find a two to the end to the little of one algorithm for unique games, then either ETH is false or UGC is false, which is great, right? You probably don't know which one, but uh, at least one of these two nice conjectures have to be false. So uh, it was indeed, in, in some sense, you know, that's one way to appreciate this result of Aurora barak Stoller because they said that, you know, there is a sub-exponential algorithm that already exists. And if you were able to improve this exponent to something which is n to the little of one, then in fact, you know, uh, you would have disproved the UGC if ETH is true. But again, we don't know uh, such an algorithm. This is in fact the best known algorithm so far uh, for, uh, you know, uh, uh, unique games. Um, 
if I had taught this class five years ago or four years ago, and I actually I did teach a Sikh version of this class three years ago, then in fact, uh, in the story part of this class, this is where I ended. But turns out that in the last three years, there is more to tell. There is new stories. And so um, uh, the punchline of the story is that now there is a new theorem uh, proved in 2018 by, um, let's see if I get it right. Pervesh, there's a question. Um, yeah. Misha wants to know if there's a surf reduction from 3SAT to UG. Uh, what reduction? Surf reduction. What um, is this? I actually don't remember what this is. I, I knew this once upon a time. Oh, no. It's like uh, glad I'm not teaching like, a complexity class. Yeah. Like the one that like preserves, like, like it doesn't like blow up like the instance size by like a poly. Ah, like, very good. Like, it's a, it's okay. It's an excellent question. And, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, what we just studied implies that there cannot be such a reduction. So Misha, now you get to tell me the reason for it. So assume exponential time hypothesis is true and prove to me that there is no such reduction. Okay, not to put you on the spot or anything. Let me, let me explain why this is true. You know, imagine, so, you know, what Misha is asking is, you know, can there be, let's say, a quasi-linear blow-up reduction? Like, is there is there a reduction? Could there be a reduction from 3SAT into UG that takes a n size instance and let's say produce an n log n size instance? If you if you if you did any of these uh, reductions that you do in like the first algorithms class or even your theory of computation class, all your reductions are actually of this sort. They they, they transform. They have they are they are called as local gadget reductions. So they transform an n size instance into basically a constant times n size instance. So it's not such a ridiculous idea to ask for such a strong reduction. But in fact, the argument that we just hit here already shows that such a reduction cannot exist. Why not? Well, imagine that you know there is a reduction from 3SAT into UG that takes an n size instance into, let's say, n log n size instance. Now, if exponential time hypothesis is true, then in fact, there cannot be two to the you know, um, uh, n to the little of one algorithm for this problem. But on the other hand, if you apply this sub-exponential algorithm of Aurora Barak story that we just studied, then in fact, you get exactly that such an algorithm. So in fact, you know, if the blow up is restricted to be like some small polynomial, in fact, the, the polynomial is kind of already decided here, right? Like if you, let's see, what should it be? If I'm getting it right, it should be N epsilon to the minus one third. It seems like, you know, uh, there is some fixed polynomial in epsilon that you can state. And you can already prove that there is no reduction with a blow off which is smaller than this size. In fact, any reduction, well, what we've done under ETH already implies that any reduction from 3SAT into UG must have a blow off of n to the polynomial in 1 over epsilon. And, you know, in fact, some precise polynomial that, you know, fits well with ABS. Misha, does that answer your question? Okay, great. So, yeah. Okay, uh, one more thing. Um, okay. Turn off the uh, the setting on the board that like makes it so when you scroll it like syncs. Oh man, that's some uh, timing for asking me to do this. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I should have turned it off like uh, in the beginning. <laughs> okay, all right. Better late than never. So uh, yeah, so so I get to tell you this like new exciting theorem uh, that was proven in like a sequence of uh, whatever four papers uh, by these authors, and uh, they proved in our language that half comma epsilon, sorry, yeah, for all epsilon, um, they proved that you know half comma epsilon ug is indeed NP hard. <laughs> So um, what's the difference between the problem that we saw today uh, and this problem? Well, the only difference is that, you know, uh, this half was actually a one minus epsilon in the conjecture that we stated. So the unique gains conjecture just says that, you know, one minus epsilon UGC is NP hard. And, you know, up to this uh, half factor, uh, basically it's already now uh, true. So in some sense, you could, uh, you know, 
you know, somewhat cheekily call it halfway there. <laughs> um, um, okay, so you could ask why is this a non-trivial result? Or, you know, why, why is this like super interesting? The, the like one, 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 one important aspect of this result is that uh, even for this half comma epsilon UG problem, and actually any constant here uh, is fine. Like, you know, it doesn't need to be half. It could be like any uh, smaller constant. For all uh, such versions of unique games problems, there still are sub-exponential algorithms. So even though, you know, I stated this ABS algorithm as saying that, you know, it takes an instance with one minus epsilon uh, uh, satisfiability property and outputs a half satisfiable assignment, well, actually, you know, there is a version of this algorithm that works even if you replace it by half. And actually you can replace it by any constant and there's a version of the algorithm that works for that constant. Uh, and what, what this result is saying is that, you know, if you were somehow, you know, sitting in uh, hopes that you could improve this ABS algorithm by some cheap tricks, uh, well, that's not gonna work because, <laughs> you know, the same tricks that apply, um, the same things, the same tricks that yield a sub-exponential algorithm for, uh, you know, UG, the one minus epsilon version of UG, also work for half version of UG. But you know, the half version of UG is indeed hard. So you know that for that version, this algorithm is not improvable, um, at least qualitatively speaking. So you know, any effort to disprove UG now is kind of constrained. Uh, it's like, you know, if you want to design an algorithm, you better think of ideas which are maybe, you know, uh, significantly different or better than ABS. Good. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is a very cool sequence of papers and it does, uh, again, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, very nice combinatorics and uh, for analysis going on in here. So, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, in addition to the result, there, is, there are other reasons to read this paper, which again, uh, you know, I hope one of you takes up, uh, although this is kind of a, a somewhat of a challenging paper, but you know, I hope that one of you takes up and writes like nice notes about it. But again, this is not one of the results that we will cover in this class. I was hoping that I get to start, uh, you know, some description of the ABS result today, but the story has taken too long, which means that it's good not to start uh, uh, stuff today. It's actually good. Um, we get to keep our discussion about the algorithm self-contained in the uh, lecture, uh, you know, next time. So next time, you know, our goal So next time, you know, our goal would be to discuss this new rounding strategy called global correlation rounding, which in particular can be used to prove the Aurora Barak Stroyer theorem. They did not prove it this way, but you know, uh, you can use this uh, strategy to prove it. But actually, you know, the reason I'm uh, uh, going to spend one whole lecture on it is because it, it can be used to prove several cool results, not just this. And so, you know, if you remember uh, on the last problem on your homework, you uh, try to design an algorithm for max bisection. And, um, and somehow, you know, there, if you remember, you made a special assumption on the SDP solution. You assume that, you know, the pseudo distribution given to you satisfies some, you know, a small, um, what did you assume there, I guess, Frobenius norm? Wait, so I guess, uh, oh, I guess an audible one. So there you assumed uh, that the SDP solution is mean zero and satisfies that, you know, this quantity, this measure of some average pairwise correlations in the pseudo distribution is small, right? And then you design like 0.878 minus square root delta algorithm for this problem. So you basically, you know, came close to match the guarantees of, uh, you know, the max cut algorithm, even for this potentially harder version where you're not just allowed to return any cut, you must return a balanced cut. Um, but you know, this algorithm that you design in the homework depended on this assumption. You assume somehow that you, know, you can find this special kind of pseudo distribution. Global correlation rounding will essentially be able to make this assumption be true. So, you know, actually there is a way to design an algorithm which essentially matches the guarantees of what you proved in the homework. There is a gap, but we'll discuss that when we come to the discussion of this rounding. But we can essentially, you know, do what you did on your homework without any assumption on the pseudo distribution. 
by spending a larger polynomial amount of time and rounding a higher degree pseudo distribution. Okay, so that will be our goal the next time. Um, and we'll maybe try to do a couple applications because you know once you like the, the, the analysis itself is very general. So once you do it, you can actually quickly apply it and you know prove some very cool results. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's what we'll do the next time. All right, so I guess uh, we can end here. And as usual, you know we can uh, do lots of questions. Um, I have a question. Can you say yes. why um, the new result from 2018 on the half epsilon hardness implies that you need to do something which is different from Arvara Barak's error? Oh, uh, these are all, you know, qualitative slash non mathematical claims. I mean, yeah, it's a good question. But um, the only factual uh, 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 claim in what I said was that. The same technique that yields a sub-exponential algorithm for one minus epsilon comma epsilon unique game also works for solving half comma epsilon unique games. So you know this this assumption that the value like the the value of the original unique game was large, like close to one, is not actually important in that algorithm. Uh, and so and you, you because of the new result, you already know that you know you can't hope to get a two to the n to the little of one algorithm for half comma epsilon ug, right? This implies that there does not exist a two to the n to the little of one algorithm for half comma epsilon ug if eth is true. Hey, um, what is the running down the algorithm that you can derive for half comma epsilon ug? Ah, uh, I think it's exactly the same. There is some dependence on the constant that sits here in the completeness, but it's still like two to the O of N to the epsilon to the one third. So same as, same as, you know, the guarantee for one minus epsilon comma epsilon unique game. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I mean, you maybe maybe you could just analyze it differently and use the assumption. I guess okay. Let me make it. May, may, let me make my comment more meaningful. I'm saying that you know any. I mean, trivially speaking, this is obviously true now. But you know, let me just redundantly say it out anyway. Any algorithm that now disproves the unique game conjecture must you know uh, crucially use the fact that you are starting with an instance which is almost satisfiable. Right. If the if the value of the instance is sufficiently far from one, then in fact, you know, the conjecture is already true. So you better use the fact that its value was very, very close to one. Otherwise, clearly there cannot be any algorithm unless you are in the mood to refute ETH. Yeah, yeah, Pravesh, I want to clarify. So um, like there's a, you wrote an n to the 10 for reduction on so this, we know this cannot happen, right? Uh, yes, here, for right? small yeah. enough epsilon, we know it cannot happen. In fact, you know, any reduction should have a blow up of n to the poly one or epsilon. Okay, thanks. Absolutely, yes. <clears throat> um, so I was wondering if the UGC turns out to be false, um, will, will any of these results that are conditional on the UGC, like Raghavendra's theorem, Will they still be valuable in some sense? Like, is there is there some insight in, in them that's independent of the UGC, um, or is it just valuable in itself to know that that they're conditionally true even if the premise is false? It's uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's it's uh, it's keeping in spirit with this uh, uh, of this lecture, I guess. Uh, not much math, but lots of stories. So, <laughs> um, uh, so Raghavendra's theorem, there is an unconditionally true statement hidden in there. Uh, it's actually not quite hidden. It's like stated as a theorem. It's hidden in what we discussed today. <laughs> And it says that the integrality gap of degree two SOS relaxation is achieved by, you know, um, some analog of RPR square rounding. 
So, uh, you know, like, let's, let's forget about unique games, okay? I mean, there are like multiple things which are, uh, which are important, Raghavendra, even if UGC turns out to be false, but let's discuss something which is true regardless of UGC. So it's legitimate question to ask, you know, what is the best possible rounding algorithm I can invent for the degree two sum of squares algorithm, right? If I write a degree two SOS relaxation for let's say the max cut problem, it's legit to ask, you know, what's the best possible rounding can I do? Okay. Now, if you think about it, you know, so we didn't, we didn't formally define integrality gap that's coming in one lecture, but basically it means, you know, is suppose, suppose, you know, you have a graph uh, G with uh, optimal value of the cut, let's say opt of G. Okay. Now let's say there exists a pseudo distribution of degree two, such that let's say this is the max cut FG is the cut polynomial. And suppose, you know, this one, this guy happens to be uh, some uh, value, let's say SDP opt. Okay. Now clearly any rounding has to incur a approximation uh, gap of SDP opt over opt, right? Because whatever rounding you do, if there's a graph whose optimal value is at most opt, then, you know, you must incur this approximation factor, right? Like you cannot, be you cannot do better than this approximation factor, right? And so, you know, uh, you can, you can always ask, you know, what is a, you know, if you can, you can ask this question of, you know, what's the max over all graphs of SDP opt over opt of, you know, the actual opt. Okay. This is called as the integrality gap of, you know, the degree two sum of squares relaxation. Okay. So in general, you know, you cannot beat the integrality gap when rounding, but you can ask, can I give a rounding that achieves this integrality gap? Can I give a rounding that always gets the best possible approximation factor that can be gotten out of that algorithm? Okay. This is an unconditionally important claim because you know, you're, you're already writing degree to SOS. You would want to use the best possible rounding for max cut. I claimed this multiple times. Gaussian rounding is not optimal. I mean, it's optimal, you know, if the true value happens to be one minus rho GW, whatever. But you know, if the true value is some arbitrary one minus epsilon, then it's in fact not a optimal rounding algorithm. Uh, O'Donnell Wu, which is like, you can think of it as a subset of Raghavendra's theorem proves that, you know, there is a different class of roundings. You can think of it as like a bunch of roundings that generalize Gaussian rounding, but it's like a fixed sequence collection of roundings called as RPR square roundings. And what O'Donnell Wu prove is that, you know, they always achieve the integrality gap for every graph. So RPR roundings achieve integrality gap. So this is an unconditionally true and important statement that basically you identify the class of roundings, which are optimal. And this is true, no matter what happens to UGC. So there is an unconditional claim hidden in all of these works and the Raghavendra's theorem, you know, basically replaces this RPR square with a slightly larger and different class of roundings. But even there, basically what he's telling you is that there is a fixed SDP and a fixed, you know, class of roundings, which is optimal if that's the only SDP you want to consider. Um, so this is basically a concrete thing that remains true whether UGC is true or not. But there's of course, you know, uh, somewhat less, um, uh, somewhat, somewhat qualitative things which are important, even if it turns out to be false beyond this kind of a claim. Like for example, UGC is, you know, uh, some, so UGC is basically, you know, in this language, just a claim that, you know, uh, the best possible approximation factor that you can get for a certain CSP is equal to the integrality gap of the degree two SOS relaxation, right? In like once I told you this, uh, this fact that I just wrote down, then, you know, UGC is, uh, you know, implies that um, cannot beat integrality gap of uh, degree two SOS, right? So in particular, it's telling you that degree two SOS is optimal, which means that, you know, if you disprove UGC, you presumably will have found some way to either use higher degree SOS or some new algorithmic scheme that somehow, you know, um, is able to, you know, beat the guarantees of degree two uh, SOS relaxation. So in general, you know, it might demand that you come up with either a very new way to analyze SOS uh, relaxations, like SDP relaxations, or come up with a new technique altogether. And so in some sense, you know, you can think of SDPs as at least demarcating what you need to do to design better algorithms. 
even if it is false, it's telling you that, you know, SDP roundings uh, may not be the way to go. You might like either you want to come up with like new ways to analyze higher degree SOS or, you know, come up with new techniques altogether. So that's like a qualitative statement that, you know, uh, definitely remains true, even if UGC is false. Like notice that, you know, if UGC is false, it doesn't immediately imply that you get a better algorithm for max cut. Um, it just means that, you know, uh, your belief uh, in the existence of such an algorithm might have gone a little bit up, but it still, you know, demarcates what you have to do to, you know, potentially design such an algorithm. It tells you that, well, you know, the existing techniques likely won't work. Thanks. But even if, even if the UGC is true, just like one follow-up comment on that, if the UGC is true, it's telling you something remarkable, right? It's telling you that there is one algorithm, not just one relaxation, one full algorithm, like right degree two SOS relaxation. It's like a very, like very um, concrete, explicit SDP and do one of the very concrete roundings. And, you know, I don't know what the approximation factor of that algorithm is for your CSP. I can only guarantee that it's optimal. <laughs> So it's like, it's, it's a crazy new statement, right? Like I can give you an algorithm. I don't know what its performance is, but I can prove to you that you can't beat it. <laughs> um, it's a pretty remarkable statement, uh, uh, you know, if you just see it's at least true. So it, it you know, in some sense, it, you know, it, it posits that, you know, this degree two SOS uh, plus rounding algorithm is in fact, you know, optimal uh, amongst all polynomial time algorithms. So, so you mentioned for all graphs, right? Yes. So does that mean like, for any graph, if you can beat this, uh, whatever integrality gap it is, yes, then you can solve P equals NP. Like you can, let's say, you can translate that to like a fast algorithm for three set. Ah, good. Uh, so if I understand, understand your uh, claim correctly, uh, you're, you're right. Like, you know, in some sense, yeah. So, you know, you can, so the like one 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 other way one one corollary of what we've been discussing is that you know you can take any integrality gap and transform it into a reduction, uh, which which you know um, a reduction from the UG problem into you know um, uh, your problem. So you know, so in in some sense that's actually how the results are all proven. So let G be a graph which you know exhibits an integrality gap. Okay. Okay. For uh, degree two SOS. Then, uh, you know, you can construct a reduction from a, a, a unique games problem into, you know, uh, let's say for, you know, max cut. So you can construct a reduction from UG to max cut. Um, uh, you know, that, that proves, so if this integrality gap is some alpha, that proves an alpha factor hardness. In fact, you know, um, what what you suggested is in fact how these results are actually proven. Uh, in oh, some yeah. sense, you know, you can even imagine how would you prove this because you're not quite analyzing the performance of the algorithm. You're not giving me a number which is an approximation ratio. So how are you going to prove something is optimal? Well, you are going to work in reverse. You're going to prove that look, you know, whatever is the performance of the best possible roundings amongst all of this class of roundings, whatever is the integrality gap. So I'm going to first prove that you know that is equal to the integrality gap by constructing such a gap. And then I'm going to take that gap and construct a reduction from UG to let's say max cut where, you know, uh, the integrality gap is the approximation ratio. I see. Yeah, it just, it just seems like really surprising counterintuitive to me because usually when I study reductions, like I'm constructing this pathological uh, specific instance that I'm reducing to from like- Good, good, problem. good. So, so it's, it's a great question. And now I think, uh, you know, there's even more reason for why perhaps you should pick up, uh, you know, uh, Raghavendra's paper, uh, you know, <laughs> to, to read. But so, so important, like the way these theorems work is that they don't, they're, they're not going to take a simple fixed graph and prove that it is hard, right? Like in some sense, that's impossible. No single graph is going to ever be hard, right? What they're going to do is like, they take this fixed graph. Let's say, you know, there is a size 10 graph which has integrality gap for an SDP, right? I'm writing a very fixed SDP, so a 10 vertex graph could actually exhibit an integrality gap, right? So let's yep. say there is a 10 vertex graph.
exhibits, you know, integrality gap. So, so, you so know, when you say exhibits integrality gap, do you mean like exhibits the worst possible one or? It doesn't know. I mean, yeah. Anyone, anyone. Yeah, I can like, take any, any, any wait, graph with exhibits just integrality just sure. gap and yeah. produce a reduction with, you know, the same factor uh, hardness. Okay. So what I can do is I can do a gadget reduction where this graph would be the gadget. I see, I see. So you're still, you still have like this pathological instance. It's just that like, yes. you're, you're kind of, every single little locally looks like the, this graph here. Exactly, exactly. In, in right, exactly. Okay. Yes. So it is still a pathological instance of the same type that you, you know, obtain in reductions. It's just that the, the power of this theorem is that you can use any fixed size example, which somehow beats the degree to SOS SDP and you know, use it as a gadget. It's, it's like a weird thing, right? Like if you, if you, if you take on like first class in algorithms or TOC or whatever, then you know, you, you, you design these gadgets by hand. Like, you know, you, you say, okay, you know, take this three set formula, make a variable, make a vertex for every assignment, connect assignments if this happens. So, you know, this gadget invention is always like a very um, manual thing. What this is in something saying is that, you know, there is kind of a transformation that takes the integrality gap and converts it into a gadget. So in some sense, you know, it's, it's in some sense, mechanizing a reduction, if you will. <laughs> so it, it's still like a, a, you know, kind of a, um, a surprising statement, uh, but yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the overarching big instance would still be pathological. It's just locally is going to look like this hard graph. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah.